Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Hi, this is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. This past week, we continued our coverage of the threat invasive animal species posed to the national park system. We also reported on the National Park Service budget that Congress approved for the next fiscal year and took you on a tour of Jean Lafitte National Historical Park and Preserve outside of New Orleans. You can find those and other stories about national parks and protected areas at nationalparkstraveler.org. This week's podcast is a special edition as we focus on looking at national parks as either threatened or endangered. If you mention the Endangered Species Act, thoughts turn to threatened or endangered flora and fauna species. Species such as the Florida panthers, or maybe the red wolves, or even the devil's hole pupfish, or the western prairie fringed orchid. But have you ever considered which units of the national park system might be threatened or endangered? Not in terms of going extinct, but rather parks that are struggling to retain the qualities that led to their inclusion in the national park system in the first place. You see, despite being America's best idea, many national parks across the country are in trouble. They face myriad threats, from climate change impacts to overcrowding, energy exploration, and air quality issues. In this, National Parks Traveler's first annual Threatened and Endangered Parks list We've looked for parks that face exceptional problems that affect their natural resource health, as well as the visitor experience. Failure to come up with, fund, and implement management plans to counter these impacts will lead to continued deterioration of individual parks, as well as to the national park system as a whole. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It's an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Rather than simply present you with lists of 10 or a dozen parks facing serious threats that might classify them as either threatened or endangered, we've come up with a list of threats to the parks and placed individual parks under each heading. Joining us in this conversation are Mark Wenzler, Senior Vice President of Conservation Programs for the National Parks Conservation Association, and Phil Francis, Chair of the Coalition to Protect America's National Parks. Mark, we'll start with you. I know in years gone by, the National Parks Conservation Association has done a, a state of the parks um, report, if you will, on individual parks and kind of given them an assessment from top to bottom. Do you think it's time that we take a, a, a closer look at these parks and how they're, how they're surviving today? I do think it is, Kurt. You know, we, uh, as you mentioned, did spend many years doing assessments of, of national park conditions. And that really established the baseline, but it's been about 10 years since uh, that work was completed. And we all know a lot has changed since then. You know, we're seeing the impacts of climate change unfold on almost a daily basis now. Things that we didn't fully anticipate 10 or 20 years ago are now becoming some of the biggest threats our national parks are facing today. Absolutely. And as we cast our net wide to try and consider all those different impacts that are um, pushing on the parks, if you will, you know, we've looked at oil exploration, sea level rise, diminished air quality, even overcrowding um, places like Yellowstone and Zion and Grand Canyon. And they're just awash in visitors and impacting um, the, the national park experience as well as the national park uh, um, resources and how they're surviving under that crush of humanity. For endangered national parks, and, and what we were looking at in that, Mark, is parks that really are struggling um, to hold on to those qualities that they were given. For instance, invasive species is a key problem at parks such as Big Cypress National Preserve in Florida and neighboring 
uh, Everglades National Park, as well as Glen Canyon National Recreation Area in Utah. Um, all those parks have unique problems, um, whether it's the Burmese pythons in Everglades or Big Cypress or Melaleuca trees in those two parks, or over in Glen Canyon where you've got um, quagga mussels, uh, tamarisk, also known as salt cedar, and non-native fishes. Um, what type of risks do these species pose to these parks? Well, Kurt, I think that it's it's an incredibly difficult problem for the national parks. Uh, these species are driving out uh, native species, um, which is upsetting in many cases the ecological balance. And it's an interesting problem because on the one hand, uh, there's there are some things the National Park Service can do um, and with, with more funding, with, with better management, uh, but there's also a global problem that they can't deal with, and that's climate change. And many of this much of the spread of invasive species is being driven by factors far outside the park services control. Absolutely. At Glen Canyon, for instance, um, the quagga mussels, they're, they're fouling up um, not only outboard engines and whatnot, but they're basically um, littering um, beaches with their, you know, their shells that are um, really turning off visitors in terms of cutting their feet and whatnot. And they're, they're driving out the native um, species there as well. But we're seeing with warming temperatures and warming water temperatures specifically, these uh, invasive mussels have been able to um, go through numerous generations in one year, whereas in the past, they might just have one generation. Yes, we're seeing that same problem with the uh, white bark pine beetle. It's you know, a problem that you've written about. Uh, just the massive tree die-off that's happening throughout the West. Um, and I think a very similar situation there where the warming temperatures are allowing the beetles to have multiple generations in a year, um, which overwhelms the tree's defenses. That, and these aren't an invasive species, they're a native species, um, but the warming temperatures have, have really upset the balance. The trees used to be able to, they sort of co-evolved with these bark beetles in a way that they were able to fight off one generation of bark beetles. But, Two or three generations that they're now we're now seeing in one year is just simply overwhelms the tree's defenses, really contributing to this massive die-off we're seeing. We think Big Cypress National Preserve in Florida is perhaps arguably the most endangered park in the system. And we say that because it faces two incredible threats. One, of course, is the invasive species, the, the Burmese pythons, the monitor lizards, even even lion fish, I believe, um, or the melaleuca trees. And on top of those threats, you've got the oil exploration that's going on there. And right now it's just exploration. But if they decide that they discover recoverable oil reserves, that's going to be another incredible impact to that park, no? Yes, that's really, really troubling. In fact, it's one of the issues that we spend a lot of time on these days um, and for the past couple of years. Now, folks may not know, but but there are parks in the system that have uh, there's uh, oil and gas rights that the Park Service doesn't own, the subsurface rights that may be owned by private companies. Not you know that many parks, but it's a handful, um, and it's a serious problem. And in fact, Big Cypress is the only place that I know of right now that is actively undergoing exploration, and that involves sending giant what they call thumper trucks to drive through the park, flattening vegetation. Um, in some cases, mowing over, you know, hundreds year old trees, uh, deeply rutting the soil, um, very, very destructive practice to look for oil and gas below the surface. Now, some people might wonder, what's the big deal with oil, oil exploration even, and even oil recovery? Um, you got the trucks come in, they, they find recoverable reserves, um, they drill well and they, they leave a pump jack and there's a small disturbance. It, it kind of goes further than that, though, doesn't it? Well, it does. They, they need, first of all, they need to get access to those sites. Some of those sites may be far within the interior of the park. That involves roads, um, that involves moving equipment back and forth, potentially pipelines. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure that goes along with that one pump jack and a lot of destruction that happens because of it. Um, and the more we fragment these already stressed out uh, landscapes, the, the more vulnerable they become. You know, we keep returning to the the issue of climate change, but that's one that's affecting that park. Um, and, you know, for that park to remain ecologically healthy, it needs all the help it can get. It, it doesn't need additional stressors like the oil and gas development that's happening today. Then uh, I think rising sea levels and then off-road vehicle use on top of what you've mentioned, uh, declining budgets, 
uh, will make that park at great risk for sure. You know, you, we keep talking about climate change and, and its impacts are, are so varied. For instance, up in Alaska, we basically are looking at all the national parks in Alaska as being on our endangered um, category because of the impacts of climate change. For instance, at Denali National Park, you've got uh, the permafrost is melting, and that's impacting the Denali Park Road. Uh, for instance, at Polychrome Pass, where they've had some slippage, um, at Glacier Bay National Park, this past summer, um, visibly malnourished bears were wandering into Gustavus looking for something to eat because as uh, the weather has warmed, the, the creeks that normally um, are um, serving salmon are getting too warm. And so the salmon aren't coming up into the creeks to spawn, and so the bears don't have the salmon for meals. Um, we've seen thousands of seabirds starving to death, um, puffin, shearwaters, auklets, um, on Mount Denali. Human waste is coming to the surface as snow and ice melts away. It's just really a, a frightening scene what's going on in the Alaska park system. Well, that's right, Kurt. In fact, I was in Denali uh, this past summer, and uh, it was quite an incredible scene there. You know, very, very thick smoke from wildfires um, that the park has never really seen before. It's happening because of the warmer and drier temperatures uh, that they're getting. And you know, in fact, I got caught in a lightning storm while I was in the park. It was it was incredible um, that the sort of weather that they're seeing there now and the impact it's having on the park is is unprecedented. Another impact of climate change is uh, rising sea levels and um, more potent hurricanes and uh, tropical storms. Sea surges are really getting incredible. For instance, back in September, we had Hurricane Dorian come up the East Coast and it basically shredded Cape Lookout National Seashore um, with a nine-foot surge of water that led to more than 50 breaches in the barrier islands of Cape Lookout National Seashore. Um, just something that we've never seen before. I mean, back in 2012 with uh, Superstorm um, Sandy, as it came up the East Coast, it created one breach at Fire Island National Seashore. And now at Cape Lookout, We've seen more than 50. I think there were 54 reported breaches. It's incredible. You know, uh, Kurt, I grew up along the East Coast, the New Jersey shore, and um, there's still damage from Hurricane Sandy evident today, all these years later. Um, we did a, a project with the Sandy Hook Unit of Gateway National Recreation Area years back, where we worked with the park and the community to think about what can they do to protect themselves from these kinds of storms going forward? Because we're all sharing those, those same um, fears about what the next storm will do, the parks and the communities that surround them, especially when it comes to barrier islands, as you've mentioned. You know, we're in totally uncharted territory. There's no telling, you know, what storm is going to be the death knell for some of those barrier islands, and they may not come back. You know, there was a report I saw the other day at uh, Cape Cod National Seashore. Um, it's been reported that the outer cape is losing about three feet of beach a year on average. That's nearly double what the rate was for thousands of years. And some people might think, well, that's just, you know, a little less um, beachfront that they can walk along. But you've got other problems associated with um, sea level rise and storm surges. You, you've got overwash. You have loss of habitat for migrating birds, loss of salt marshes to these rising sea levels. And you just look up and down the East Coast and, you know, you've got Cape Cod National Seashore, Cape Hatteras, Fire Island, Cape Lookout, Cape Canaveral, all these national lakes, all these national seashores exposed to pretty much the same problem, although at different degrees. Well, yeah, and you know another one that's uh, impact that's really concerning is nesting sea turtles. You know, as we lose, that's some of the most important habitat down at Hatteras and um, the Outer Banks of North Carolina. If we if we lose those barrier islands, if they erode, uh, if we lose the dune systems uh, that protect habitat, you know that's going to have a very serious impact on nesting sea turtles. And we, we would expect to see populations decline if that were to happen. Well, too, there's also the issue, I would imagine, of how warm it gets above the water. Because uh, as those eggs are going through incubation in the nest, um, the warmer the sand is, that influences the sex of the, the hatchling. And so you could end up with uh, one sex more predominant than the other. And how would that affect reproduction going down the line? I think you make an important point about sort of the, the cascading effects. You know, you have one change that, that leads to many other changes. And ultimately, you have ecosystems that become incredibly stressed and potentially collapse. Okay, we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back with Mark and Phil. 
listener, and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. Dry Tortugas National Park, 70 miles from Key West, just very well might be the most remote national park in the lower 48. But when you arrive, you're surrounded by crystalline waters for snorkeling, kayaking, and relaxing on pristine beaches. There are sunken wrecks to explore, coral reefs swarming with colorful marine life, and history in the brick walls of a Civil War era fort. The Yankee Freedom 3, departing from Key West, can get you there in a little more than two hours. Visit them at drytortugas.com. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. Okay, we're back with Mark Wensler, the Senior Vice President for Conservation Programs at National Parks Conservation Association, and Phil Francis, the Chair of the Coalition to Protect America's National Parks. We've been discussing the various threats and uh, impacts to national parks across the country. Phil, it seems that year after year, they're having to rebuild Highway 12 that goes down the length of Cape Hatteras. And so what position does that put the park managers in, in terms of trying to protect the parks against these natural events? Yeah, I think it's almost an impossible uh, situation to be in. You'll never have enough money to restore all those roads, you know, in a timely way. Uh, Throw Gulf Islands into that mix, too. I mean, look how many times their highway has washed away over the years. It's not going to get any better for them. Uh, And then the heavy rains up in the mountains of North Carolina, Blue Ridge Parkway has sections of road that are washing away. It's three to five million dollars to fix it every time that happens. Uh, so uh, the managers are going to have declining staffs, less resources, increased pressure from the tourism uh, economy, and uh, and so to try to manage those priorities will be enormously difficult. I mean, it just requires a a shifting of of resources, both manpower and and finances. And that takes away, I would imagine, from the resources that you can put into natural resource management. Yeah, well, and there's not a lot of discretion anymore. I mean, you think about the parks budgets. You know, 90% of most parks budgets are spent on personnel. So you're really talking about a change in what people are working in and do they have the skill sets to do that match what the needs are. Um, Maybe not. Uh, Where can they find additional funding? You know, if if Cape Lookout, Outer Banks, Gulf Islands, uh, Big Cypress, Everglades, well, you name the coastal parks, you know, it's very possible. uh, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, you know, if all of these parks are being impacted at about the same time, uh, New Orleans, uh, you know, where's the money going to come from? Uh, does it mean that we're going to have to close some parks because they're not safe? Or will the Congress have to come up with enormous new amounts of money? Uh, what is that going to do to the uh, deferred maintenance backlog? And money that might be set aside for that, hopefully one day, one of these years, when the Congress passes a bill. So it's uh, it's going to be very, very, very hard 
on on the managers making those decisions. It's going to be hard on the employees who live and work there. Um, it's going to be a tough way forward if this continues, and I have a reason to believe that it will. Overcrowding. Um, this year, we saw Acadia National Park um, in Maine adopt a traffic management plan as it tries to come to grips with uh, congestion on the Park Loop Road and atop Cadillac Mountain. Zion National Park, for two or three years at least, has been trying to um, come up with its own traffic management plan. Uh, Arches National Park, uh, I thought, had settled on a plan um, that would require a reservation system of sorts to allow people to come in, only to have um, the Interior Department say, no, we're not going to go down that road just yet. Yellowstone National Park, they're trying to figure out what to do with crowds. Yosemite, it just seems to go on and on and on. Glacier National Park um, is also looking at uh, um, traffic management along the Going to the Sun Road. What type of threats do these crowds of tourists um, pose to the parks? I mean, on one hand, it's very heartening to see such a love for the national parks and whatnot. But um, as the old saying goes, um, we're loving these parks to death, no? Well, I think, that, yes, that's that's very true. And I think, you know, some of the impacts we're seeing, obviously, is just a stress on the entire park system, um, on the on the managers in the national parks. You know, the more they have to spend time on doing crowd control, on repairing roads, on making sure that the, we can accommodate all the visitors, the less time they have to do other things like protect the resources. And so I think that there is a concern that the more crowding we see, the less time the Park Service has to do another part of its core mission, which is resource protection. Well, and it's even more complicated, too, because every situation is different. Uh, and expectations by the visiting public are different, depending on the park. Absolutely. If you go to the Great, if you go to the Great Smokies and they have uh, 2 million people a year that visit Cades Cove, but they're accustomed to it, surveys have indicated they're okay with it being crowded. Uh, not so much in Yosemite, not so much in Yellowstone, not so much in Zion. Um, and always there will be competition for um, which strategy should be followed. Uh, people who are in the tourism business build their economic models on increasing tourism every year, which, of course, is at odds with managers with declining budgets and declining staff trying to manage the people who are inside their parks. Uh, yeah. And how do you protect those resources? And, and, you know, you're in a desert climate or you're in a semi-tropical climate. Uh, you're in a mountain climate. It's, it's very, very complicated. I'm not sure that we really have in place in the National Park Service the policies and strategic thinking yet uh, to address this. Maybe so. Maybe it's uh, in the last six years since I retired. Maybe it's been put in place, but I really haven't seen it. I think it's something that the, that the servers will have to work on. You know, a lot of these problems um, are either inside the parks or, or have moved into the parks. Um, and yet there are also external threats to national parks. I mean, you look at the Appalachian National Scenic Trail, um, there are several proposals to run energy pipelines through the trail corridor. Um, at Biscayne National Park, there long have been efforts to restore and protect a stretch of the only tropical coral reef in the continental United States. And yet the park's efforts to protect that section of reef have been derailed by politics. Um, you look over at Cumberland Island National Seashore, and there's that spaceport proposal that would launch rockets over the wilderness area in the National Seashore, you go up the coast to Colonial National Historical Park, and you've got this power transmission line more than seven miles long through the James River that creates a visual impact on Colonial, historic Jamestown, and even the Captain John Smith Chesapeake National Historic Trail. Um, now, certainly the, the Park Service in, in most, if not all these cases, has an opportunity to, to weigh in with its opinion, but oftentimes the decision makers are above or outside the park service. It's really something to hear all that put together. And you think about the competing demands upon superintendents as they try to do their jobs. 
how they're trying to run the park internally and how they're trying to work outside the park, enlisting the support and assistance and uh, trying to develop values so that we're all on the same board with the care of protecting the parks for future generations and and then also providing the kind of customer service that uh, and, and protection uh, that everyone deserves and the parks deserve. It's really difficult. Um, you know, think about a, a middle-sized park who maybe doesn't have an assistant superintendent. So the superintendent's got to work inside and outside the park, got to work with congressional delegations and county managers and city officials. And um, it's going to be very, very hard in a political aspect of it. Um, you know, right now there's more conversation about contracting out park operations. Uh, my experience has not been very favorable with regard to that. And I don't think it's the answer to our problems. There may be some opportunities to contract out uh, some aspects of operations, but, um, you know, the, so sometimes the employees who work for those contracted out operations are not quite as committed to fulfilling the, the mission of the Park Service. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's more about making sure there's a profit, which is required by law that the concessioners have an opportunity to make a profit. So uh, you're asking some very good questions and uh, it sounds like something that the, uh, the old second century commission need to address and, uh, and to engage uh, the public, you know, in a greater way than maybe we have before. Uh, but once again, you know, what is the, uh, life cycle of these strategic uh, plans and uh, how do we keep these issues in front of the American people so that, and I think the American people would buy into much of what we need, but uh, we seem to have difficulty reaching the right people at the right time. Well, you're really uh, pointing out an age old problem, Kurt, one that goes back to the very founding days of the national park system is that you know what what is compatible development outside the park boundaries, um, and I think you know with the, the parks you're talking about, it's also what does it mean to be a national park? What kind of experience are we trying to preserve for visitors? Certainly, sending rockets over a national park is not consistent. I think with what most people would want to experience when going to a wilderness uh, coastal park. Um, it's the quiet. It's it's the natural sounds. It's the night skies. Uh, it's the it's the lack of industrialization. All of those things are influenced by the, the kinds of development you're talking about. Now, with the, the Endangered Species Act, I mean, uh, a plant or animal species is placed uh, under the, the act's either threatened or endangered status with the idea that the managing entities will come up with a strategy to help those species recover to the point where they can be safely removed from a listing um, and thrive going forward. What hope do we have for the national parks that are facing some of these threats, whether it's invasive species or energy development or overcrowding? I mean, it's it's got to be a tough situation to look at. Well, I think there are some impacts that, that can last multiple generations. So it's really a question of time scale. You know, you see, look at the oil and gas development that's happening throughout the West. It's just incredible pace uh, that it's, that's happening around many, many national parks. You know, those leases can be in place for decades. They can be renewed very easily. Um, that land is then off the table for conservation purposes. So, you know, it may feel like forever if you're talking about two or three generations. Um, other impacts, perhaps we can we can solve a little more quickly. Um, the management issues that we talked about and overcrowding, you would hope that an issue like that could be solved, um, you, you know, within this span of one administration. So it really, it's really a kind of a mixed bag of time scale of, of how these impacts can be addressed and which ones are irreversible or not. Well, sure. And, you know, one of the, one of the problems that exists is that we really don't have a good handle on all the species that we manage inside of the park. And we don't have a great handle on how they interact. What is what is the change in the uh, uh, climate going to mean for these little micro ecosystems? And 
Uh, how is it go- that going to affect these species, and what kind of um, result will occur as one species maybe declines in population? What is it going to mean to other species? What is it going to mean when there's as as they roll back uh, clean air and clean water regulations? What is that going to mean to the species? What is that going to mean to the whole ecosystem of these parks? We need a more dedicated effort to resolving and identifying these issues and understanding how this world that we live on, we sure as heck don't need to start down the other path, which is to cut funding for these studies and and to, I think, aggressively manage, adaptive, adaptively manage uh, these parks so that so that we can uh, better anticipate change and react to the change. <laughs> I know in the Smokies, which is not far from uh, where I live, uh, they found an armadillo on Highway <laughs> 441 going through the park. Now, I don't know if that armadillo hopped on an RV and came up from Florida for a vacation, but but they found one in the park. Um, so... It makes me think of the Everglades and and big cypress and the pythons and you know what else are we going to have? We have a lot of invasive species in many parks already. Yeah. So what what happens when these ecosystems begin to change and what can we really do about it? I uh, I'm afraid I don't have the answers, but I know that we should uh, put some of our best minds together and really think about this and. Um, examine our, our strategies and policies to make sure they're all in alignment so that we have a chance to protect and preserve these parks for future generations. We've been discussing National Parks Traveler's first annual threatened and endangered parks list with Phil Francis, chair of the Coalition to Protect America's National Parks, and Mark Wensler, the senior vice president of conservation programs for the National Parks Conservation Association. You can find our package of threatened and endangered park stories at nationalparkstraveler.org. That's our show for this week. Next week, we'll be joined by Teresa Pirino, president and CEO of the National Parks Conservation Association, to look back at news-making events involving the national park system this year. For National Parks Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. See their successes at www.gtnpf.org. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.